If you follow the story behind on Instagram, you may have seen that I went to Boston last weekend for the Sound Education Conference at Harvard University to be on a panel with other history podcasters. That included Liz Covart from Ben Franklin's World, Patrick Wyman from Tides of History, and David Stenhouse from Backstory. I respect these podcasters greatly, and it was such an honor to be in the same room as them. Because my travel schedule is pretty hectic this month, I only stayed in Boston for one day, so I didn't get to experience anything outside of Harvard and the train station. But if you've ever been to Boston, you know that it seems there's history on every street. I got to hang out with Chris Nessie from the House of EdTech podcast while I was there, and he suggested I do an episode relating to Boston. Since any history regarding Boston would be a huge undertaking, I wanted to pick something a little more obscure, but still very much Boston related. And food is always one of my favorite topics to research. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind Boston Baked Beans. But first, a quick message. It's been almost a month since the story behind book has come out, and I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone who has taken the time to send me messages about the book. Send me pictures of you holding the book, or even finding it in bookstores. I love seeing my book out in the wild like that, going to places I've never been to. To everyone who has pre-ordered, the giveaway is coming, hopefully within the next week. But I did want to let you know I appreciate all the support you've given me with the book. Thank you, Trivia Buffs. If you haven't gotten your copy yet, you can go to thestorybehindbook.com, and there you'll find links to the book on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. Beans have been around for at least 20,000 years as a dietary staple. Homer talks about chickpeas, for example, in the Iliad, and beans are mentioned in the Bible as well. Beans were a common part of diets because they were easy to cultivate, cheap to produce and sell, and easy enough to make. But they did develop a reputation of being a poor man's food. When it comes to Boston baked beans, before we talk about those beans, we actually have to talk about the pot most associated with Boston baked beans. Before Europeans came to America, Native Americans used thick pots made of earth and clay for baking bread. Cornbread was especially popular and was baked in a pot called maizeum, which if you remember from elementary school, the Native American word for corn is maize. But the pot in this story plays a prominent role in Boston, but we'll get to that in a bit. Beans were especially a staple in the diets of Native Americans. In fact, they were baking these beans and sweetening them with maple syrup. By the time settlers arrived from Europe, pork salt was added to baked beans, and they became a favorite, especially because they were easy to make ahead for the Sabbath, which pilgrims and Puritans were not allowed to cook hot meals on. Instead, they would bake a big pot of beans in a pot based on the earthen pots used for maizeum, and then leave the pot on hot bricks overnight to keep warm for the next day. From the 1600s through the 1900s, baked beans on Sunday became a popular tradition for many in Massachusetts. The traditional pot of baked beans became a symbol for Boston in 1907 during a celebration called Old Home Week, when the organizers created a logo featuring two hands clasped either above or below a pot of baked beans for the event. More than a million stickers with the emblem were distributed, and there were all sorts of pins and collectibles made for the event with the logo. Historical societies at the time were said to be upset that of all the history and symbols in Boston, the event used just a plain pot of beans to represent it. But those in the souvenir business already saw opportunity, and postcards were made with slogans like, You don't know beans until you come to Boston. Other Boston postcards were sent back to the printers so that the old Home Week logo could be added. Beans then became associated with Boston, giving it the nickname Bean Town. There's no exact date I could find to indicate when the maple syrup used in baked beans by Native Americans was replaced with the molasses, which is now what gives Boston baked beans its sweetened flavor. Boston wasn't just known for its Puritan tradition of making baked beans for the Sabbath, it was also known for molasses. Boston was a part of what is known as the Triangle Trade you might remember from early American history class. Sugar cane and molasses was sent to New England from the West Indies to make rum, which was then sent to the west coast of Africa to exchange for slaves. The slaves were then taken to the West Indies to be sold to work to harvest the sugar cane and make the molasses, which was then sent back to New England to continue the trade. The rum from New England, Massachusetts in particular, was known to be some of the best and demand was high. 
which meant molasses was especially prominent in the area. But the reason molasses became associated with Boston in particular was because of the Great Molasses Flood of 1919. When I read this, I had to double check a few sources because it sounded made up at first. We've probably all heard the idiom slower than molasses in January, and you might think it came from the South because it sounds like something that needs to be said by a Southern belle, but it actually comes from the Great Molasses Flood, which took place January 15th, 1919 in Boston. In Boston's North End, a tank holding 2.3 million gallons of molasses had just been filled a few days prior. The tank had been built during World War I when rum demand was increased, but they rushed the job of building the tank and cut corners when it came to taking precautions. By 1919, the tank was barely holding all the molasses. In fact, one source I found said that they knew the tank was dangerous, but instead of fixing or replacing it, they instead painted it brown to help conceal all the leaks. Just in case you missed the amount of molasses in that tank, it was 2.3 million gallons. To put that into context, that's about three Olympic-sized swimming pools worth. Those surrounding the tank on that day were already used to hearing the squeals and rumblings from it. But when it finally gave way, it made a roar as molasses burst from the tank. The wave of syrup was 15 feet high and caused destruction to nearby buildings almost instantaneously. And if you want to know the actual speed of molasses in January, it traveled 35 miles per hour, cooling and becoming more dense as it moved along. The molasses flood covered a half mile radius, killing 21 and injuring 150. Rescue and cleanup was especially difficult. A few victims were so covered in the sticky, hardened goo that they were unrecognizable. The company, United States Industrial Alcohol, had about 120 lawsuits aimed at them, although they tried to shift the blame to a possible bomb, which was even a bit plausible, as this was around the time anarchist groups were known for bombings across the country. But in the end, the flood was found to be the result of a shoddy tank. Some say you can still smell molasses in that area today, especially on hot days. But that smell has become part of Boston, and molasses added to baked beans has become the traditional recipe for Boston baked beans. Information for this episode was sourced from History.com, Smithsonian, ThoughtCo, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. This week on Trivia Tuesday in the Story Behind Discussion group on Facebook, Daniel posted Walt Disney designed the modern trash can after he was displeased with seeing and smelling the trash from the original designed wire cans. His design enclosed the can and had a flip lid to drop your trash in. If you'd like to talk about trivia you pick up during the week and have it read on the show, join the Story Behind Discussion group on Facebook. This episode was brought to you by the Story Behind Executive Producers, who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash thestorybehind. Thanks for listening.